Welcome back for more Bio 20. This is still week number six. We're in part one, anaerobic reactions, but now topic two, which is glycolysis. So you should be able to tell me the location, reaction, or reactants, products, and energy production in glycolysis, and then tell me how glycolysis or other sugars fit into glycolysis. I'm not asking you to memorize glycolysis, as entertaining as that would be, but there's no point. So I'm not asking you to memorize it. Glycolysis is referred to as a universal reaction. And the reason why we say that is virtually all cells that we know of are capable of doing glycolysis or a variant thereof. It occurs within the cytosol. So the cytosol is a phrase I haven't used before or a term I haven't used before. So if I were to look at a cell, here's the nucleus. Here's our cell membrane. The cytoplasm, strictly speaking, is everything between the nucleus and the cell membrane. The liquidy part of the cytoplasm is called the cytosol. Cytosol is not part of endoplasmic reticulum or mitochondria or Golgi apparatus or a lysosome or a peroxisome or a vacuole. It's everything in between. The term itself, glycolysis, tells us exactly what it's going to do. Glyco means sugar and lysis, which we've seen before means break. So we're just going to break up a sugar. There are 10 individual reactions in glycolysis. <clears throat> you need to have a chemistry background for the words to make sense. So I can show them to you and it will just seem like gibberish. But if you had a background in organic chemistry, just a little bit of a background, you don't need much, just a little bit of a background. The words suddenly make a lot of sense, especially when you see the structures. What we're going to start off with for this glycolysis is a six-carbon sugar. I'm going to show it as six C's in a row. The generic term I can use for a six-carbon sugar is a hexose. What we're going to do is split it in half, and we will make two three-carbon sugars. Got it. That three-carbon sugar that we make at the very end is referred to as pyruvate. So looking at this figure here, we're going to use glucose as the main example because it's the easiest that we could shove into this system. Glucose actually shows up as either a ring or as a chain. So here we're just looking at the ring form. What we're going to do first, we're going to take this glucose. We're going to put energy into it to form this like starting point. This section here is all endergonic. The start of glycolysis is endergonic. The end of glycolysis is exergonic. We're going to take this structure here, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We're going to chop it in half, and then we're going to turn each of those pieces eventually into a pyruvate. The way in which we do that utilizes a bunch of steps. These turn out to be those steps, just for the sake of saying it. So we go glucose to glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Huh? We add a phosphate onto the glucose. We turn the glucose into a fructose. We add another phosphate onto the fructose. Done. We're going to take the fructose. We're going to slice it in half. When we do, we get two different three-carbon molecules, they are not the same, so we need to turn one of them into the other. So we need to just do a little slight rearrangement to make them look the same. Once we've done that, I mean, we're going to turn this one on the right, DHAP, dihydroxyacetone phosphate, into the one on the left, which is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate. We now have two glyceraldehyde 3-phosphates, which are then going to be converted into something called 1,3-bisphosphoglycerate, except we have two of these. We'll rip off a phosphate which will give us 3-phosphoglycerate. We're going to move that phosphate. 
to phosphoglycerate. We're going to form a double bond structure in here, and that gives us phosphoenolpyruvate. We're then going to rip a phosphate off and we get rid of that weird double bond, and that gives us our pyruvate. All of this is catalyzed by enzymes, so all of it is fair game for regulation. A lot of the words seem really strange, like hexokinase and glucose 6-phosphate isomerase and phosphofructokinase 1 and fructose, or uh, that should be an R, fructose bisphosphate aldolase. All of these words, notice how they all end with ACE, telling us it's an enzyme. The thing with these is they're describing what's going on. A kinase adds phosphates, and aldolase is we're going to break something into aldols, so it's an alcohol with an aldehyde on it. It tells us everything that we're doing. It's just written in organic chemistry. Again, you do not memorize that. So then how do we get things that aren't glucose into this? Well, it's simple. We can actually trade out glucose for any hexose. What are the hexoses? Well, we have fructose is one that you've probably heard of. Another very common one is called galactose. You've never heard of those words, but that's okay. But what if we had a different chemical? What if we had a, a glycerol? So glycerols are sugars. We've heard, we've actually heard of glycerols before. We just don't realize that we heard them before. Or starch. Starch is a bunch of glucoses. So how do we digest starch? Well, you take the starch and you start ripping off all the low glucoses. Easy enough. If we have other sugars, we just might need some extra steps, but that's okay. So for example, we could have something called sucrose. Sucrose, O-S-E, so it's a sugar, carbohydrate, is fructose and glucose. So we have to break up the sucrose. That's step one. We've heard of sucrose before, too. That's table sugar. Or the sugar that we think of as being sweet. The glucose, I could dump straight into where it says glucose. The fructose... I could dump in where we hit the word fructose. So we need to have a breakup step, and then we have some insertion steps. But then it all runs the exact same. You know, we take the glucose, we run it through some endergonic reactions, we chop it in half, we extract energy from it, we move on with some exergonic reactions. We could do the exact same bit of logic with... Lactose, it's just, do you have the ability to chop up the lactose or not? That's a different question. Starch is, we have to just rip off glucoses one at a time. But that's, that's all we have to it. We just take a sugar, we convert it to this form here in the middle, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. You don't need to remember, it's called fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. We chop that in half, then we extract energy from it. The first half is endergonic. The last half is exergonic. The end. That's glycolysis. What we will produce as a result of this will be two ATPs and two weird things that we haven't seen yet called NADHs. NADH, if you would like to, it to have a full name, stands for nicotine amide amide, amide, adenine, dinucleotide. The H is telling me something about its chemistry. It's a type of chemistry referred to as redox chemistry. We don't care. It is also what we call an energy intermediate, meaning it's just there to shuffle energy back and forth. It's not a storage device. It's not meant to store energy. It's just meant to move it. We use NADH actually to make ATP, so hooray. When we look at it, it comes in two forms. NADH is the high energy form. NAD, missing that H, is the low energy form. 
2 ATP isn't a lot, so clearly we need to do something more than just this. What we're going to talk about next is what happens when we start to run out of NAD, because we need NAD to make NADH.